by the authoritarian uh, government of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, within the background of a deeply polarized society in which half of the country loves Erdogan and the other half loathes him and there's increasingly nobody left in the middle. And unfortunately, at least for the time being, there seems to be no graceful exit from that crisis. Many commentators suggest that understanding the crisis goes through understanding Turkey in the previous decades of 1980s and 1990s before Erdogan's AKP came to power. Uh, and in fact, there are a number of dramatic developments in the decades of 80s and 90s, including the coup of 1980, uh, the economic crisis of 1990s, uh, the collapse of the country's traditionally dominant center-right parties in the same decade. All these developments have pr uh, brought Islamists, political Islamists, hitherto considered a marginal force in Turkish politics to center stage. I think in this regard, the role of the military in Turkey, the secularist military, cannot be underestimated. Uh, the military, after the 1980 coup, set out to refashion Turkish society, uh, law of unintended consequences, uh, which we're going to look at in a minute, uh, created, of course, a, a societal environment which uh, placed the nemesis of the military, political Islamists, into power. In this regard, I'm especially delighted that today uh, we're joined by Ece Temel Kran, uh, who is now in the U.S. Uh, traveling around for the launch of her most recent book, uh, The Time of uh, the Mute Swans, uh, currently recently translated into English. Uh, Ece is one of Turkey's most uh, prolific and known writers, uh, commentators, and journalists. Uh, she has published, uh, how many, a dozen? around a dozen <laughs> books. Um, her, works, uh, her books have been translated into more than 10 languages, from Arabic to Polish, and of course English. Uh, she's a recipient of many honors, uh, awards, um, as well as uh, research uh, positions. Uh, most recently, she was a visiting fellow at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. She's written for many outlets, including The Guardian, New York Times, and Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, very impressive resume, so really delighted you can join us today, of course, to discuss uh, your most recent book, The Time of the Mute Swans, which I think is a, a moving piece of art uh, in, on Turkey in the aftermath of the 1980 coup. I'm also delighted that my friend Ambassador Robert Finn, to my left, can join us today. Robert has served as the first U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan in more than 20 years when he kick-started the U.S. Embassy there, I think in a container, right? Yeah, can I get the yeah, Kickstarter kit? We moved up to a container. Yeah, we moved up to a container. Uh, he's has had a keen interest in all things Turkish and Turkic. He was U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, uh, served in Turkey three times, of course, fluent Turkish speaker. Since uh, uh, leaving the U.S. State Department, uh, Robert has taught uh, Turkish literature at Princeton, and he's also the author of the early Turkish novel, uh, something on which I know very little. Um, but definitely one of the uh, um, country's experts on the Turkish language, literature, and uh, politics. So it's really an amazing panel. I'm very excited that we can both look at Edge's book and then go back to a discussion of literature and politics in Turkey. And I have to note that uh, this morning I was getting a number of emails and text messages from friends. It looks like we have competition. Uh, there's a court case going on in, in New York City today, uh, this Turkish-Iranian dual national Zarab. Uh, he's been uh, taken to, uh, he's been indicted for allegedly violating U.S. sanctions on Iran through an alleged money laundering operation. So for, a, a whole bunch of friends emailed me and said, we're so sorry, tell Edge we can't make it will be in New York, but I'd rather be here than at a courthouse. So thanks for coming. I appreciate it. I'm going to now have Ajay uh, come to the podium, talk to us about her book, and I'll invite Robert to provide some commentary, and I'll come in at the end uh, to say a few words and also act as a moderator. Once again, Ajay uh, Temelkran. Uh, Thank you. Hello and welcome. I'm most delighted that, you know, Washington Institute provided a warm uh, space for my book, The Time of Mutes Ones, and I'm equally delighted to have Robert Finn here, a distinguished expert of Turkish uh, literature and Turkish language. Um, I'm in, here in the U.S. Uh, I traveled from, uh, from New York to Bucknell. Uh, I spoke in City University in New York, in Cornell, Bucknell, and I'm going to speak in MIT, Harvard, Columbia, and then I'll be back home in Zagreb. Uh, I'm on a book tour, uh, therefore today I'm going to be talking about my novel, The Time of Mutes Ones, but also I'm going to talk about the uh, United States as well. Uh, I came here uh, to the United States not only to do, do the book lounge, but also to tell you to hurry up, get over the shock, 
and join us in our insanity uh, that we had a lot of experience in Turkey. And I want to tell you how the things will turn out even worse. So we have to, you know, get, your, get ourselves together uh, and that we need your uh, intellectual stamina uh, because insanity in Turkey has tired us so much that we cannot um, do it without you, without the intellectuals of United States and uh, Europe. Um, this book, The Time of Mutes Ones, is my recent novel, and it takes place in Ankara. Uh, most probably you always read and hear about Istanbul, but nobody really speaks about Ankara, and he, he, that city is known to be the most boring city in Turkey, and you have to hate it. This is part of being Turkish. You have to get bored there. Although I do think that Ankara has a poetry as well, as well as Istanbul. It is not uh, that magnificent, obviously. It doesn't have Ottoman uh, roots. Uh, it is just a small uh, city in the middle of uh, Anatolia. Uh, so it's not a gorgeous place, but it does have a poetry, and I think the poetry of Turkish Republic lies there. Um, the novel takes place during the last three months uh, in 1980 uh, that led up to the 1980 military coup, um, an incident that has not been told enough. And the novel um, is somewhere in between real and unreal. This is what I do in life in general. I write things between real and unreal, between nonfiction and fiction. And it is inspired by real events during the summer of 1980, before the military coup. Um, and I want to tell about these events because it's, the, the book is pretty much about them. And I do think that the real uh, incidents that happened then were, were far more interesting than the novel. Um, in 1984, uh, the real uh, you know, story takes place in 1984, after the military coup. Uh, the leading general of the military coup, uh, Kenan Evren, um, wanted to build a park in Ankara. And for those of you who don't know Ankara, there's already a park there, and it's called Swan Park, and there are swans in it. Uh, but the leading general of the coup wanted to build another park. Um, so, he, and he wanted some swans in his park. So he moved the swans from Swan Park to his park, which is called Seymanar. But these swans hated the, you know, forced displacement. So they wanted to fly back to the original park, Swan Park. Unfortunately, they uh, hit the bu tall buildings in the city and died one by one. Um, and then the leading general wanted to take some serious action about this. So he ordered the veterinary faculty to come up with a serious plan. So the obedient veterin veterinarians decided to perform an operation on the swans. They moved a certain bone from the wings of the swans so they cannot fly anymore. I wrote this novel in 2014 and it was published in Turkish in 2015. Throughout the year in 2014, I lived in Ankara to write the novel and to make the research. And whenever I met someone, I asked them the same question. Do you think, do you know if swans can fly? And without an exception, they all said, no, swans cannot fly. And I thought, this <laughs> is what a military coup does to people. It makes you forget that the swans can actually fly, and they cannot fly because they had an operation. You can find the original diagrams of, these, of this surgical operation in the book as well. I found it in the archives. There's another real story behind this book. 1980 was the year of the beginning of the end for Turkish politics, if you ask me. But also, it was the year uh, that for the first time in Turkish history, the migrating swans from Siberia stopped in Turkey. Before that, they never did that. But the 1980 year, in the year 1980, the summer of 1980, that was the first time. So it felt to me as if the swans 
We're trying to remind people that the swans can actually fly. And after 1980, each year, each summer, they kept coming until 2013, the year of Gezi uprising. After that, they never came as if their mission of reminding people of themselves, of their capability of flying was already accomplished. Isn't that magical? I, mean, I, I really quite find it magical. Um, while going through the archives to write this book, uh, I spent more than six months in parliamentary, uh, Parliament's archives. I saw the seeds uh, of insanity sown in Turkey that is now currently flourishing. And I found out that what Erdogan has been saying for the last two decades had already been said by Kenan Iran, the leading, milita the leading general of the mil military coup. And I already understood, uh, I also understood that the dominating narrative about my country for the 1970s was not completely correct. It was, it, it actually, there was a missing part there. And this book is about that missing part, and it is also about the untold story of Turkey. In Turkey, we have been uh, spun with this dominant narrative about 1970s, about the time before the military coup of 1980. They told us that there was a civil war, everybody was killing everybody else, the food shortages were so unbearable. Therefore, uh, the military coup came as a relief to the entire society. However, the entirety of this story was completely different. One, middle class was strong in 1970s. Second, uh, the concept of uh, kindness and generosity was not the monopoly of religious discourse. And third, Solidarity and sharing were still prevailing over winner and loser divide. I thought, and then, you know, I came to think about remembering. How do we remember things? How do we forget things? And I now believe that remembering is a form of forgetting and vice versa. And um, remember, you know, when, you, when societies are offered the chance to remember, they usually get bored. They don't want to go through that again. Yet, you know, uh, if we have the chance to remember what lies in the past, it does not only provide us with the chance to understood, understand what happened in the past, but also it provides us with a um, way out of our problems. Um, so, I thought of remembering as a politi you know, a probably a probable political cure for our times of insanity. Because when you put the missing part in the memory, and then you become another person, and then you can uh, you know, remember that the swans can fly, and you are, in fact, capable of doing things. Um, this is what I have to say about the book. But it is related to current situation of Turkey and also uh, Europe as well as United States. Nowadays, uh, intellectuals in Europe and United States, as far as I could observe, they're talking about uh, rising populism, and this is one of the you know, most fashionable, most fancy topics of you know, intellectuals la uh, circles lately. But there is this particular attitude when they are handling the situation, when they are discussing this topic, they talk as if uh, this is an interstellar object all of a sudden hit the world, that there is no backstory, that there is no history to it. But I do think that there is a history, and in my country it started in 1980 when, they, when you know, the military coup made people forget that the swans can fly and they are capable of resisting. And then when I look at the European narrative uh, about 1970s and United States narrative, you know, the dominant narrative in the United States for 1970s, it is not completely different. Uh, the dominant narrative for this country, for instance, the 70s was naive, confused, and dysfunctional, and probably everybody had bad teeth. Uh, 
But if we can go back and find the missing part in our memory, what happened, you know, if we can really remember the entire story of 1970s, and then we can take that missing part and our, you know, uh, lost or forgotten capability of doing things and then adapt it to the future. Um, I, I've done journalism for 20 years and then I was fired like many of my colleagues. And, you know, for 20 years, uh, I was doing all show literature. I came to think that neither journalism nor literature is capable of changing the world. Words are too fragile for that. However, it is capable of uh, reminding people of beauty and preserving beauty to remind us that we are, in fact, um, capable beings. We are going through time, some evil times, and the victory of evil does not come overnight. It lays a long siege around the human mind, and then the mind forgets that it can create, think, imagine, and most importantly, remember. So I do think that literature has, by its nature, has the capability to remind us who we are and how limitless we actually are. So this is why I wrote Time of Mutes once, and I hope uh, it can also ring a bell uh, when you read it, uh, you know, when you are once more subjected to the dominant narrative of your country's experience of 1970s and what your country lost during 1980s. This is all I have. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, AJ. Uh, I go back a long way, as they say, in Turkey. I've been um, uh, going and coming there for um, 50 years now. Uh, and uh, before we were talking in the other room, and, and Soner asked me, were you there for the coup? And I said, which one? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been through, through a few of them. And um, uh, we were living in Istanbul, uh, not at the time of the coup. We left in, in June of 1980. I was there. Um, uh, my first assignment as a diplomat, giving out visas in Istanbul. And my wife, Helena, who's here, uh, was teaching uh, at Boazita University. Um, so we experienced um, the events that were later transposed into the new narrative that you were talking about. Uh, but they did take place. Uh, Helena was followed. Uh, by people on her way to the university, and we only found out about it, followed in daily. Uh, we only found out about it because when she went over the hill into the areas where the, um, uh, the poorer people lived, they noticed, and they were the ones who told the police, they said, someone is following that foreign woman every day. There was a, a bomb uh, in a, a textile manufacturers uh, association office in our building. And we used, and this is in the center of Istanbul, uh, uh, near uh, one of the uh, lovely hotels overlooking the Bosphorus, an idyllic place that we would lie in bed at night and listen to the shots of, of leftist and rightist groups fighting in the park. And, um, and we would have to go out at night because I was a diplomat and there were uh, invitations and uh, you would be stopped by men wearing raincoats and they'd ask for ID and you didn't know who they were. And you were hoping that they weren't people who wouldn't like the fact that uh, you were a foreign diplomat. It was a very, very scary time. It was a scary time forever. Uh, and that's why people, st oops, people started saying um, as you uh, mentioned in the book, when, when it gets to 20 people a day, then the military will step in. And that's exactly what happened. And then, of course, they made their own narrative and they changed things. And we're seeing a change of narrative uh, in this country. And uh, unfortunately, there are lots and lots of parallels uh, between what has happened and is happening in Turkey and what is beginning to happen here. So if only for that, you should read her books and you should also read this one, her political book that came out. She publishes book about once, books about <laughs> once every other day, it seems. <laughs> so this is another new one. Uh, but very useful information to see um, what can happen and what does happen. And um, the support of the foreign community for the Erdogan government uh, in the years since 
as something that she touches in this book, and a lot of that uh, came from support given to it by the Western press, uh, which didn't report things uh, in a thorough way, uh, and they still don't, and they didn't after 1980, uh, partially because the Western press, the European press, and I don't just mean American, um, is typically limited uh, to people who don't know Turkish and who don't leave Istanbul. As you said, you're an exceptional writer who writes about Ankara. I've lived seven years in Ankara, and I committed all my youthful sins there, so I have very happy <laughs> memories of, of Ankara. Um, but it's, it's a city that's not known. Uh, to most people, and the other cities in the countryside are even less known. So people get a very biased view of what Turkey is really like, because it, like the United States, there are many different Turkeys. Uh, and, and when you go to a different place, you meet a different situation, you get a different, a different point of view. So the, the religious uh, people who, who now are uh, influential are people who were, under the, many of the years of the, of the Republic, were, were kept down. Religion was, was completely de-emphasized. And if you, I remember, um, speaking, this, I was in the Peace Corps in Turkey, too. And I remember in, in 1967 being in Ankara, I was teaching at a, a, a university, and the, the only one I knew who was fasting during Ramadan was the secretary in our Peace Corps office. And one of the reasons for that was if you were working for the government and you fasted during Ramadan, you might have trouble keeping your job. And now the exact opposite, I think, is probably true. So these things change as each group comes in. Um, they, they bring a new, a new narrative that you have to deal with. And trying to be objective uh, is very difficult because you can't get the information. Uh, each group controls the information uh, that is allowed to be disseminated, and people who only have, as in this country, people who only have access to that information um, tend to believe it. You know, it's the, the Nazis who told us that if you repeat a lie long enough, people will believe it. Um, so that's true. And um, so that's another factor. But the, the part of the book that, um, to me, was very interesting, I mean, you told the, the story of the swans, and it's a beautiful uh, a beautiful metaphor, and, and it's certainly true. And I certainly I know the Swan Park very well, and I always wondered why the swans never left. <laughs> <laughs> we took our son there many times. Um, but the other part of the book, which I think will be uh, maybe uh, more telling for for the American audience, is that you you catalog and delineate the disintegration of society in this little neighborhood of, of Ankara, which is a leftist neighborhood, but across the creek at the bottom is a rightist neighborhood. And because of, of the, the methodology of your narrative, which is told by several different characters without transitions that necessarily let you know who is now speaking, you have to read a sentence to say, oh, this isn't the little boy, this is the little girl from a different family, different set of values. So things get a little confused because you're learning them <laughs> to a great deal, deal through children's eyes who don't really know why things are happening, but they know that things are happening. <laughs> and you see how this, this uh, building, the neighbors, uh, one of whom is a supporter of, of the rightist, we can assume, although that's never clearly delineated, what we know is that she doesn't necessarily like these people who she calls communists. But anyhow, you see how their, dis their relationship disintegrates. And you see how the social structure, the physical structure of the city disintegrates. So um, there was a, a, a bomb that destroyed a bus that went to this neighborhood. So the city just stopped all transportation to the neighborhoods. And now you had to walk. Uh, the mayor, was, who was a leftist at that time, was trying to build a, 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 a subway, a metro system. Ankara now has a very nice metro system. The government was trying to stop that because it didn't want to give all these poor people access to the city. They didn't want them to be able to come and go uh, just as they wanted. So all of these things were going on. And this, and this disintegration of the social fabric uh, that you're dealing is something that you never get. Uh, in the in the in the political reporting about these things, how it affects people's lives, how how you and I are forced to take a political choice by other people, even though we don't want to. I remember uh, my neighbor telling me of her daughter who was uh, at a university faculty that was controlled by one of the political factions, and she was forced to participate in illegal deeds with them. They took her up to the roof and they say, "Either you do this, or we're going to throw you off." And so then she was tainted by it. And this happened left and right. There was no middle left. 
And with the situation that you have today in Turkey is an inheritance of that. There isn't much middle. People don't have a dialogue. I was around before 1980, and there there was still a civil dialogue going on uh, between politicians of the left and right in the same way that we used to have in this country, a healthy dialogue on the presumption that eventually we will come to a compromise uh, and do things for the, the good of the country. Um, but the militarization and the, the, the um, ideological polarization uh, that took place after 90, uh, 1980 led to the situation you have today where people are one or the other, and people are not in dialogue with one another on politics. Either they say nothing at all, or they only associate with people who, who are, are, are like themselves. And um, again, a parallel with this country, if you look at the map of Turkey, um, politically, it looks like the map of the United States. You have blue on the outside and red on the inside. Uh, and just like the United States, if you actually look at the percentage of voters and voting patterns in the country as a whole, you'll see that there are a few places that are ostentatiously for one side or the other, but that in most places, the margin is, I uh, should say, less than 20%. Uh, between the left and right. So in other words, there is a possibility for that compromise. There is a possibility for things to change and come back. But for that, you need a leadership that is open to that, a leadership that will encourage that. You need a leader uh, that will do that. And uh, without uh, castigating anybody in particular, uh, I think the reason that Erdogan has been able to, to be so successful is uh, largely due to a lack of leadership on the part of other people uh, in Turkey, and I could go into Turkish politics and the system and why this happened, which I won't do. Um, but we're living with the consequence of that. And um, walking these things back is difficult, uh, but it can happen and it will happen. Uh, nothing good lasts forever and nothing bad lasts forever either. And Turkey is a country that, yes, needs support from outsiders, uh, particularly from the Europeans who are always willing to say, aha, see, they're not really like us. Uh, without giving them the benefit of the doubt. And um, it al we also need to keep up our dialogue with Turkey, even though our relations are uh, uh, very, very bad at the moment, because, because the, the other option for Turkey is to switch to other people, to Iran and Russia in particular, um, which is not going to help Turkey in the long run and will certainly not help us in the long run. Um, so to get back to the book, I think it's a wonderful picture in, in Turkish literature. Uh, it's a rarely seen picture of, um, of little people, of neighborhood people living their lives. Turkish literature has been uh, dominated by Istanbul, and not only by Istanbul, but, but by people like us in Istanbul, okay? There aren't that many books about the people who are living in, in the, in the um, lower income district. Very few books about people outside of Ankara. There are some now, but typically, uh, like I said Ankara, I meant to stumble. Um, typically, you don't get this point of view. So for, is, this is a rare focus uh, on a very, very important part of Turkey that we need more of. So I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was so kind of you. Right. I guess I'll uh, jump in uh, just to finish up. Not having the literary skills of either Robert or Eze, <laughs> but being a nerd, I thought what I would do is provide uh, political background to uh, Turkey after the coup of 1980 and events that have transpired since. Uh, but first, a personal note. Uh, so I was uh, raised in Istanbul, but growing up, I spent a lot of time in Ankara. I have family there. I would go there every summer. I did one of my uh, master's degrees there, also lived in Ankara. And until I read your book, I also thought that swans could not fly. I spent a lot of time at the Swan Park. It's, <laughs> it's, an, incredible, it's an incredible piece of work, uh, very moving uh, piece of art on Turkey. Definitely highly recommend it. Uh, time of the Mood Swans, great book. So uh, in terms of looking at Turkey after the coup of 1980, and I think this is where the law of unintended consequences comes in, uh, the Turkish military moved forward to fashion a new country because they wanted to break with the 70s, uh, uh, they wanted to create a new society. The coup was predominantly an anti-leftist affair. It meant that half a million leftists were uh, sent to jail, many were tortured. Uh, it destroyed Turkey's vibrant leftist movements, uh, pr pretty much forever, I would say, meaning uh, severing the link between the left and working classes, and that job was done after the coup. Uh, it was illegal for someone to be a union member and a party member at the same time, it was illegal for unions to donate money to working class parties, which meant working class parties could not be working class parties. They moved and became uh, middle class parties, which is what happened to CHP, 
that went from being working class under edge of it to becoming a middle class party by 1990s. What happened when the working class parties and the left vacated uh, poor districts, working class districts, was that political Islamists moved in 1980s and 1990s and organized. And I think, as I agree with you, the AKP did not emerge from uh, nowhere. It actually emerged from the void left from the, dis uh, left from the left, which was destroyed after the 1980 coup and whose uh, departure from working class neighborhoods meant that the AKP and Islamists could now organize there. That was one effect of the coup, I think, this social engineering gone wrong. Uh, but the other part of it, of course, was that the military, again, because the coup was an anti-left affair, thought that um, allowing some religion, uh, departing from Ataturk's model of secularism, therefore, into government and education, was it not a bad idea because that would inoculate Turkish society against leftist movements. A little bit of religion wouldn't hurt. Uh, I think that also went completely uh, uh, wrong. Uh, the military eliminated uh, Turkey's traditional, let's say, Kemalist, secularist firewall between government and religion, education and religion. Uh, that had been a strong firewall until then. Uh, compulsory courses on Sunni Islam were introduced for all students, uh, uh, as well as uh, programs on Islam on public network TRT. That's very important. In the 1980s, TRT was Turkey's only TV network, and it's remained so until the end of the 80s until 89 when private networks came up. So for about 10 years, Turks actually watched religion paid with taxpayers' money on government. And one form of one religion, actually one sect of one form of one religion, let's say. Uh, that, of course, I think had an effect that was probably irreversible in terms of Islamization of Turkish society. Okay, again, I think the military is thinking this is how you, what you do against the left, but of course, uh, the elimination of the firewall meant that uh, it would never be restored again. Uh, uh, so ironically, the secularist military empowered its nemesis, political Islamists, by its policy of eroding the firewall and taking it down. Uh, a couple of other uh, you know, dramatic changes in the aftermath of the 1980 coup. One was uh, that the, uh, the, the generals decided to ban uh, politicians uh, who had ran the country in the late 1970s, whom they blamed uh, for the crisis of 1970s. Uh, and the foremost among these politicians, of course, was uh, Turkey's prime minister throughout the 1960s and 70s, Demirel. Demirel was the head of Turkey's center-right movement, Justice Party. His party was shut down, and he was banned from politics when Turkey had its first free and fair elections after the coup in 1983. In his absence, of course, there's a need for a center-right movement. Uh, center-right politicians set up another party. Demirel's ban was lifted later on because the people liked him. They wanted to come back through a referendum. He set up his own center-right party, and Turkey's dominant center-right pillar that had pretty much ran the country ever since it became a multi-party democracy in 1950 was therefore divided into two irreversibly through the act of the military. Uh, Turkey became a democracy, multi-party, free fair elections, 1950. It's 2017. Not counting uh, years spent under military rule, that'd be one after 1960 coup, one after 73 coup, and two after 1980 coup. That's 67 years altogether, not counting those four years. Uh, Turkey was ruled by the left for only 17 months. In the 1970s, height of European socialism, working class movements, and the leader of the charismatic uh, uh, left, uh, the, the charismatic leader of the left, Ejevit, not counting Ejevit years, this is a center-right country. Uh, its center-right movement has dominated it, and its center-right movement was divided into two by the act of the military, uh, as a result of which now you have two parties by the late 80s. They're called True Path Party and Motherland Party. One is Demirel and one is Ozal's. The two center-right parties basically cannibalized each other, despite the fact that they had few ideological political differences. True Path Party was a little bit more rural, Motherland Party was a little bit more urban, but uh, politically and ideologically they were not far apart, it didn't matter. Their leaders cannibalized each other, uh, that became even worse in the 90s after Demirel and Özal passed the baton to uh, Çiller and Yilmaz. And I think 1990s were therefore a, a decade horribleist in Turkey. They were not only wasted because of economic crisis, but the fact that the people lost their faith in the political elites because the elites looked like they were only about destroying each other self-empowerment, self-enrichment, and not public service anymore. And I think that cr cr undermined the credibility of the dominant center-right pillar. It was not a shock, therefore, that following the 2002 economic crisis, the center-right parties were not only voted out, but they also both failed to pass Turkey's electoral threshold to enter the parliament. They went from together having 
nearly 55, 60% of the vote in the 1990s and 80s to having dominated Turkey's political landscape pretty much unbroken since 1950 to becoming two parties, both of which fared under 10% nationally. That brings me to my last point, the threshold. Uh, it's an issue that I grappled with in my most recent book, uh, New Sultan, Erdogan and the Crisis of Modern Turkey. I was trying to look at inflection points for Erdogan, to be fair to him, and say, if there were inflection points for Erdogan where he had to pick A or B, why did he pick B? Why did he become more authoritarian, although he did not start as such? And I decided that the threshold was one of these inflection points. Uh, here's how it works. So Turkey has a pretty high electoral threshold. Uh, parties need to gain 10% of the vote to enter the parliament. It's the highest in any uh, democracy. Now, most democracies, uh, not the U.S., it's a two-party system, but most multi-party democracies have a threshold. It's usually 2.5%. It makes sense because if you, every party gets in, you can never form government. Some countries have 5% threshold, uh, you know, depending on uh, the, the, the movements that they want to exclude. Uh, Turkey's threshold is the highest. It's 10%, and it's also an invention of the military. Um, it was put in because... Uh, the military's main concern was the Kurdish Nationalist Party. Uh, the Kurdish Nationalist parties in Turkey typically poll around 6.5%. That's kind of an historic solid rate throughout the 80s and 90s. So the threshold could not be 5. It wouldn't be enough to block the Kurds out. It couldn't be 7. That was too random. So let's make it 10. Safe way to keep them out. Fine. Kurdish Nationalist parties could not enter the parliament. Kurds ran independence to enter the parliament, after which they would still form a parliamentary club. So they bypassed the threshold nevertheless. But the threshold actually killed the center-right parties in the 2002 elections after they had cannibalized each other, destroyed the public's faith in the political elites by what they had done. Every election in the 890s was no more about who would serve the country best, but whether this leader of the center-right would jail the other leader of the center-right and if after the election they would have a deal so that nobody would end up in jail, no government would finish its term. Uh, Turkey had three economic crises, uh, no government that ever ran more than two, three years in the 1990s. So definitely a completely wasted decade. And I think if there's one reason why the Turks voted in large number for Erdogan's AKP, which promised to bring change, clean government, it's because they had lost their faith in their elites. And I think that has a lot to do with what happened to the uh, political party system. Whenever I go to a new country, uh, there are a few questions that I ask. Uh, one of them is, uh, where can I get good fish? Because I'm from Istanbul. Fish is like religion. Uh, second is, where can I do good yoga? I like to do yoga. And third is, what is your political party system like? I think a country's political party system explains a lot why it works and why it does not. Turkey's political party system was destroyed in the 1990s and 80s, uh, in large part to what the military did, all the uh, social engineering and a uh, lot of unintended consequences. And... And I think the, th the threshold in this regard is probably one legacy that remains, uh, meaning uh, not only the center-right parties failed the threshold because they were completely destroyed in the 1990, uh, in, uh, 90s, uh, that they, they both failed the threshold in the 2002 election, but the way the threshold works is uh, if a party fails a threshold, doesn't matter by what margin, 9.9, .9, the, the seats that they'll be getting in the parliament typically go to the first uh, uh, party, uh, the, the party with the largest number of uh, votes, meaning. So the AKP, at each election after 2002, emerged with many more seats than its share in the uh, votes. This worked in 2002 when they entered the parliament with 34% uh, uh, of the vote. Uh, and because the threshold cut out all parties but one, they got all the seats that the other parties will be getting, so they ended up with two-thirds of the seats. So if Erdogan had moderated or had adopted a, you know, the model of uh, religious pluralism and better democracy for Turkey, and he, has, he had refashioned his party as a centrist movement, uh, not the Islamist movement of the past, by November 2002, after having won two-thirds of the seats with only one-third of the vote, he probably said, oh, wait a minute, why do I need to moderate? I have more seats than, you know, I, I have enough seats to change the constitution, and I can if I want to. And I think, in my view, that was, that's why I said it's an inflection point. It may have looked like a blessing to Erdogan because it gave him uh, a complete political domination of the legislative. But in my view, it was a curse because it meant that Erdogan could actually never really keep his moderate platform because he never had to be moderate because he always had a majority of the votes in the legislature, although he never has so far, his party that is, 
has never won a majority of seats in the, in the, in the, in the public vote. <coughs> and I think that it remains, in my view, as part of Erdogan's legacy going forward, that uh, his party has always been um, empowered with unrepresentative majorities, meaning more seats in the legislature than his share of the votes in the populace in general. And perhaps if there was a moderate Erdogan, we never saw it, uh, because the threshold did never allow that to flourish. And, and perhaps, of course, going back to the 1980 coup, uh, it's ironic that the threshold that was put in place to keep uh, Turkey's unwanted political movements at bay actually destroy Turkey's mainstream movements and keeps them away uh, from power now, but also has empowered Erdogan and pr probably created uh, what I would call uh, his party AKP, that is an AKP on steroids, a party that was always more powerful in the legislature than it was actually among the people, which therefore never felt that it could, should seek consensus or build consensus because it never was forced to. The, the party system never worked. So I'm looking forward to the day where Turkey's party system uh, can, can be representative of the country again, and, but I think uh, we're a long ways from that. Why don't I stop here? I know that I went through a whole bunch of nerdy details, a lot of things to uh, digest. And uh, I know there are a lot of good questions waiting in the room. I'm seeing uh, my colleagues and friends around. And uh, it's really a, a great conversation. And I'm extremely moved by uh, uh, your presentation, Eja. So uh, uh, <coughs> I know you like to write about Ankara. But I actually wanted to ask you about why this book and why, why the theme of the book. Is there a personal reason why this, you decided to write it about the swans and the park and the 1980 coup? And maybe we'll take it from there. Um, one of the real stories that is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, one of the real stories. Uh, my presentation was not that good because I forgot to tell a lot of things. Um, one of them was uh, another real story be, which inspired me to write this book uh, that happened in 2013. Uh, during the Gezi uprising, which was the biggest rebellious act after 1980. Uh, in Ankara, university students, while there was a uh, tear gas attack uh, from the police, they were trying to save the swans from tear gas. So each and every time there was a tear gas attack, they were uh, protecting the swans with their bodies. That actually inspired me to create two, these two characters, Aisha and Ali, both eight-year-olds, uh, who are trying to save the swans from the crippling operation of the military coup. Uh, so it was actually, you know, I, I was inspired by today to create a better past, <laughs> maybe, or vice versa. I really don't know. Most probably there was Aisha and Ali, and they were trying to protect the swans. And, uh, you know, we all know that there were people who were trying to protect other people during the days when, you know, violence was integral part of daily life in Turkey. And my, you know, personal reason uh, was that uh, during 1980s, as you said, TRT uh, was the only channel in Turkey. And the first thing that the military coup did uh, was banning, the, banning some words from the state lexicon. And one of those words were resistance. And there were like hundreds of words that were banned. But the, the first one was resistance, the word resistance, and in Turkish, it's drenish. It was so incredibly interesting to me to see that that word that has never been mentioned for 30 some years came out in 2013 as the most popular word. Uh, people were doing hashtags during Gezi uprising, diran, da, 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 you know, resist this, resist that. So it was as if, although uh, a military coup, a violent act, tried to erase the entire memory of people, it came out. People remembered that word and what that word applied in life. So that was my main inspiration to write the book, because I felt I owe something to my country. Um, this is a different country. I was in New York, and New York is another country. Uh, <laughs> But I know, I, I, I think you know what I mean when I say, you know, there's a lot of uh, poetry around Istanbul, but not as such in, uh, uh, for Ankara. And Washington is quite the same. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on in New York, but nobody really talks about Washington except for incredibly beautiful House of Cards, which is now, has now come, came to an end, unfortunately. I'm so sad about that. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I wrote the book. I, I owed something 
to my country, and this is another country where people come from other countries. So the meaning of country is something completely different for you, probably. Or for New Yorkers, it is different. Because somebody told me, don't say my country, because there is no country here. We all come from different places. And you know, when you say country, it is United States. Um, and as well as like, you know, I started thinking, you know, you are in the beginning of insanity. And I have been, you know, I, I visited, you know, some places before coming here, and I heard some stories which was, which were actually exactly the same stories that we have been through 20 years ago in Turkey. Somebody told me this story, which was so interesting. Uh, she was taking her kid, an academic, uh, to the kindergarten after the day of the election, and all the teachers of the kindergarten uh, daycare, uh, they voted for Trump. And she said, when I took my kid, they were standing there like, you know, suck it up, like we won. And this grudge, I don't know where it's come from, or is it manufactured maybe, I don't know, was the first thing we experienced in Turkey. And then, you know, people think that all this insanity will be limited to White House or Westminster in London. But then uh, the ethics created on the highest levels of politics uh, will trickle down to infil infiltrate the lives of the masses. And then, you know, watching news is unbearable to you, maybe, now, but then your daily lives become unbearable because you will be facing the clones, the minions of Trump, so to speak, and they will multiply in millions so fast. This is the horrifying part. This is why, you know, Robert was so right to say that, you know, this polarization dates back to 1980, but then it became so swear that our daily lives become unbearably tense after this, you know, clones multiplying in millions and they are rubbing their so-called ethics on our faces. And, you know, Turkey's system of values uh, was deconstructed during 1980s and reconstructed again to comply with the um, market-focused uh, society. But Erdogan took it to another level. It's manufactured hatred, manufactured violence, tension, whatever you call it. And as far as I, un you know, I observed in Europe and in the United States, uh, this rising populism has a similar pattern all around the world. And I do think that we shouldn't waste our time by, uh, you know, f concentrating uh, on the unique aspects of our country, but rather find that pattern and find a way to break that pattern together. As I said earlier, uh, these countries, Pakistan, Turkey, Russia, we are so exhausted what we have been through, the confusion, the complexity of the situation. And until Trump, the United States did not understand what Turkey is going through. Until um, Nigel Farage, uh, Britain did not understand what Turkey has, go has been going through. Or it, this goes for Netherlands, for this goes for France. You know, all the rising populist readers popped up one by one. And then they turned back to Turkey and said, oh, now, yeah, we know what you mean. On the, uh, I'm, you know, going on forever. You know, I'm going beyond your question, but uh, I have to, uh, you know, I really want to say this. And on the night of the election in the United States, I was going through social media. There was this funny thing. I guess this person knew uh, a lot about Turkey. And somebody tweeted something like this. Uh, I bet Turks are laughing their asses off now, you know, after seeing Trump is elected. We weren't. There was this bitter smile in our, you know, on our faces. Uh, because we we know that we are going we were we were going to watch the same insanity only this time uh, on a giant screen of U.S. politics, and you know when you come to the last phase as we are in Turkey of this insanity, uh, the human fabric changes dramatically, and what you think of now uh, as something that could protect, uh, you know, is something that could be, you know, uh, stopped by the system itself, by the checks and balances, do, uh, does not stop, and it gets into your daily life. And then this uh, human, uh, this final retreat of human mind begins. And then you start asking yourself, because you're subjected to evil every day, 
you start asking yourself, is human evil by nature? And this is a horrible, tragic question. Uh, and this is why I wrote this book, because I kept asking myself, is human evil after being subjected to such outrageous political and ethical uh, failures in my country? Uh, so, and I wanted to say no, human is not evil. And we have to remember this because our times of insanity can easily make a person forget that human can also be good, human can also be capable. This is why I want to pay my debt to my country. And you know, by writing this book, I wanted to remind everybody and myself actually that human is not evil because it is a t we are going through a time that is very easy to think so, I guess. Thanks so much. Uh, Robert, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. That was very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. It's true. And, and uh, uh, again, to go back to what I said before, that's why I, I like this book because it shows a society that clearly was beautiful in its little neighborhood way. Of, uh, uh, the, the leftist lady was, was going to sew a dress for the rightist lady, but it fell apart over politics. Well, that wouldn't have happened a few years before. And just a couple of more boring things. Um, one very important thing that I, I think is a, a, a flaw in the Turkish system, and I've always said this, is that um, elections are organized according to a party list, meaning that the head of the party determines who is going to run for every seat in parliament, which means that inevitably the parliamentarians are not responsive to their voters, they're responsive to the guy who puts the name on the list, who can and most certainly will remove them from the list next time around if they don't do what he wants. And that's why you create, whoever it is, I mean, this, all parties are guilty of this, you, you create people who, who are just sycophants and do what you want instead of being representative. And that re increases the resentment of the voters who see that they're not being heard from and they're not being responded to. So I think this is a big, a big problem uh, in, in Turkey. Another thing, when you were talking about uh, the disintegration of the connection between the left and the people, uh, I noticed when I was there, I went there in, in, in uh, 67 in the Peace Corps, and it started at that time that people, young people like me uh, who came from nice Istanbul families and were educated and were uh, 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 very approachable to Europeans in their way, who lived in, in both worlds. Those people were the people who built the Turkish Republic. Uh, until Turgut was always the first Turkish leader who was not born in Europe. Okay, Kenan Evren was born in Bulgaria. Aditurk was born in Greece. Inunu was born in the Balkans. Uh, so there was a sea change, and those people, those two, three generations of people who had built the republic, with all their, their flaws and failings, because they imposed as much as they could their value systems, and Turkish literature is full of examples of this novels from the 30s with all the young people in the government riding through the countryside at night, playing arias on, in, uh, uh, on their uh, car radio while the peasants were just standing and looking at them, that kind of thing. Well, it came around. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, these nice young people didn't come to Ankara anymore. They stayed in Istanbul because now there were international corporations and banks and uh, great jobs that you could have in, in Istanbul. And who would ever want to live in Ankara, which was always the universal uh, 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 feeling. Uh, so those people weren't there. So who was there? Well, Turgut Özal was there. <coughs> and other people like him who came from the countryside who said, well, you know, getting a job with the government and being a district administrator, you get a car and you get a house and you get a hooker, that's really nice. And so they came in and of course they brought in their friends and their relatives and gradually you had a takeover, and this is of course still only partial, but you had a takeover of the government. So the sociology changed and, and that changed what happened in the society as well because they came from backgrounds where religion was part of life, not the, not the, the kind of religiosity uh, that you now see in Turkey, but there were people who were who were Muslims who lived in a Muslim world uh, in the same way that Europeans live in a Christian world, even though they may not go to church, uh, that everything is influenced by this. And so gradually the coloring of the society changed. And now we have, uh, you know, an extreme example of that. And um, one way, oh, oh, with the other little, well, I'll just finish in that. Um, I purposely looked at Egyptian films from the 1950s, and Egypt in the 1950s in these silly films. Um, 
were leading uh, imitation European lives. You know, civil servants would have dinner and everyone would drink wine and the women would be wearing uh, uh, open dresses and makeup and the girl would sneak out with her boyfriend at night, et cetera, et cetera. Just very simple films. But now in Egypt, you, you don't see those same people. Those same lady would be wearing a scarf at the dinner table and there wouldn't be any wine. It's changed. And that kind of change also took place in Turkey. And um, just one other sad point, you were talking about all the words that were banned. Unfortunately, this is an old Turkish practice. And uh, most famously, Abdul Hamid banned all kinds of words, uh, including nose, because he had a big one, and star, which was the name of his palace. So the, the, uh, the soldiers in 1980 were not innovators. They were just copycats. <laughs> Abdul Hamid also banned electricity. Uh, he was afraid of spies, um, but he also liked the opera, so a sultan of many uh, faces and crises. So I have uh, lots of questions waiting. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Uh, please wait for a mic to come to you and identify yourselves. Uh, Christian? So Christian Carl, I'm from the Washington Post. Um, I wanted to ask you, Edja, if I understand correctly, you lost your job as a journalist in 2011 from Habert Turk? Uh, 20 2010? 2012. 2012, okay. What kind of um, censorship do you now face inside Turkey? Are your books appearing in Turkish in Turkey? Are there any kind of, any sorts of constraints? Have you had tweets declare outlawed by the courts? Uh, you know, what sort of constraints on your freedom of expression are you experiencing now? And I believe you live outside the country right yeah, now. Yeah, I am. Okay, thanks. And nobody asks me anymore why. This is a very tragic thing. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the, you know, before I came here, I went to a cafe in Zagreb where coffee is wonderful. Zagreb coffee is wonderful. Anyway, and, you know, there was this cool young waiter, uh, and he was playing Riders on the Storm in loud voice. And in, at each table, there was a very old man smoking and reading a newspaper. And he was playing Riders on the Storm. It was a fantastic Balkan Noir movie <laughs> opening scene. <laughs> And he said, where are you from? And I said, Istanbul. And I said, uh, I've never been to Istanbul. He's like this, you know, James Dean type. And I said, go before too late. Uh, and he said, uh, I'm from Bosnia, love. Everywhere is too late for me. <laughs> so, so we had this moment. So, you know, these conversations are becoming more and more normal. Like, go, go to Istanbul before it's too late and so on. Anyway, I'm living in Zagreb, a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. Um, I did. Uh, I was. A, I became a columnist. Uh, you know, on an early like I was very very young, 27, and everybody thought that I was 60. Actually, many people. Uh, so yeah, I did it for 20 in like 10 years. I uh, two for two times I was the most read political comment uh, women political woman political commentator, and I was two times most so you know among the most influential social, social media personalities, blah, blah. Uh, and it took them like 15 seconds to fire me. And the you know, entire telephone call, I was in Tunis then writing Women Who Blow On Nuts, another novel. And you know, my editor-in-chief called me and said, AJ, you know why? You know why? This was the first sentence. And I said, yeah, I know why. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. And that was it. Like, my entire career was over. Uh, and it's not that losing a job. It's not important losing a job. Uh, the thing is, you're stigmatized. Nobody will hire you again. Uh, so, uh, and then the social media lynching began. And at the time, nobody knew about social media lynching. I thought all these people were real, in fact. And then we learned that they were paid, they were on payroll by the governing party and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was a year that I thought everybody hated me in the country. Um, the censorship is, well, they, they couldn't hire me. Nobody could hire me. That was some sort of censorship. And, but books is a different story. Uh, I think, uh, you know, people ruling the country uh, believe that nobody reads book anyway, so we can allow them to do that. But now it's coming to that as well. Like you know, they're coming after that as well. Uh, the distribution uh, web of books is like controlled, and uh, my books are banned from prisons, for instance. They, I, I send. You know, I have 
quite a lot of friends in prison at the moment. I send my books and they don't they don't give it to them. Uh, so it's you cannot have it in you know public li not public libraries but you know school libraries and so on and so forth. And they're not all political, by the way. You know, I'm a political person, but my books some some of them are not political at all. But still, if you see you know if they see my name, that that, that cannot go into prison. Uh, on top of that, you know, the daily life, uh, as I said before, it's not you know. Uh, it's not the censorship is not always systematic uh, and it doesn't follow the rule. Sometimes, uh, you know, they see my name and they think there was something wrong with this woman, so maybe I shouldn't put this book, you know, on the window, sort of. But I cannot complain, my books are still published in Turkey and they are sold in Turkey and read. I'm so Happy for that, obviously. And, and you still asking. have many, many followers, uh, of course, in Turkey and elsewhere. Aja has uh, over two million followers on Twitter, I think, despite everything. Uh, so you're definitely a, a bright face of Turkey. You so. know, 50% 50, 50 are haters. <laughs> <laughs> they hate me more. They, they follow me more religiously. Somehow. One of the things I wanted to point out is that everything has been uh, modernized. So uh, in your novel, uh, you mentioned how uh, when the coup happens in, in, in 1980, Everybody in Ankara is turning is, is burning their their water heaters, turning on their water heaters, typically w for wood in their apartments, so they can burn the books. Yeah. And I remember at that time people going through their libraries and throwing out the books, uh, all these books. And and you know even I worried about my books. I put some things behind the other books. <laughs> and uh, now they don't worry so much about the books. Yeah. About anybody who has the wrong bylock uh, password oh, yeah. control on their computer gets immediately arrested. Uh, and they're controlling everything's in the internet. Uh, the uh, connections, Twitter and, and uh, uh, other things just get turned off arbitrarily. All of a sudden, there's no news today, and then a few hours later, it's back. So it's become a lot more sophisticated. Yeah. And yeah, nobody reads books. Yeah, one of my books was, uh, was uh, you know, pass, uh, it was recorded as evidence in one of the recent arrests. And it was about Venezuela, nothing about Turkey. But I thought they thought most probably, oh, this woman wrote it, so most probably something. I read that book. It's seditious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just on this issue, uh, I think one of the metrics of uh, uh, detecting how, in my view, a society turns authoritarian is when the media stops criticizing or uh, screening the government, but starts attacking and criticizing the opposition, which is what's happening in Turkey. Um, the, it's very easy to be targeted by the media if you're in opposition, but almost unheard of if you're in government. And I, I agree with you on the insidious nature of authoritarianism. I think it's not that uh, there's a decree that goes out to every uh, public official, every government official in the country to say, do not ever you know, put anything by Ejet Temelkran anywhere. It is just that the small guys start to think that if I do this, the big leader is going to like me. So maybe it's better if I give her a hard time. And of course, the big leader, by the, the great leader, by the time he finds out what has been done to Egypt, will have to stand behind it because then he looks weak otherwise. So I think people will start channeling or mirroring authoritarianism in their capacity as public servants because this is what they think that the leader wants from them. And that's when a society flips. And I'm seeing a lot of signs of that in Turkey, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions, comments? Yep, yeah, please, in the middle here. Hi. Just wait for the mic, please. Um. <laughs> okay, Lisa Hins, I'm an assistant professor uh, of political science at Johns Hopkins University, SAIS, just up the road, um, and I study authoritarianism and identity politics in Turkey. Um, and I want to say thank you for your eloquence, for your bravery, and for your prolific writing. I use a lot of pop culture sources in my own work um, in terms of extracting identity understandings from Turkey. I use films, I use novels, I use cooking shows, oh, um, and actually in my teaching as well. And to try and get my students um, in European and, and Middle East politics and science to understand the effects of the coup, I use Babam Beulum quite mm. a bit um, in terms of you talked about the breakdown of city structures, and that's quite a bit about the breakdown of family structures and exactly. how they can be pieced back together. Um, and so I'm very excited to use the time of mute swans because in Ankara, in Kulu Park, I saw a lot of people protecting swans during Gezi. Exactly. So this is this is fantastic for me. I want to just ask a quick question. Um, so you said that you know the the sign the you know wingless or flightless swans were a sign that people had forgotten that resistance was possible. 
And, you know, I've been just many, many friends, but going back and forth with a friend of mine who's in a political science department at a university in Turkey where a number of people have been let go and arrested. And he's terrified. And we were together in Gezi, and we were talking about writing something about the carnival atmosphere. And now the words he uses are insanity and melancholy. And your last book, fantastic. So you. do you think people have forgotten that resistance is possible? Do you see another Gezi? Are you optimistic in any sense? Thank you very much. Hmm. Um, last 10 years, I don't, you, you won't experience this in this country, but last 10 years, uh, I, the, the question that I have been asked most frequently was, is there hope, both in Turkey and outside Turkey? And I always said the you know, same thing, which I will repeat now. I don't believe in the word hope, because there are times during human history where there is no hope. But I do believe in determination because it can it, it can be the main drive of uh, human mind. Whereas people mostly think that hope is. Um, my Dutch editor uh, for another novel uh, told me a story uh, which inspired me a lot. Um, she was a Jewish uh, and she was a Jew, and her grandfather and grandfather met in Auschwitz, and her grandfather fell in love with. The, this young woman, and I don't know where he find it, but he found a little cabbage, and he put it on a stick, and he gave the girl this cabbage, you know, imagining that it's a rose or a flower. And this is already beautiful, but I am more interested in the young girl who uh, agreed to imagine this cabbage as a rose. I think this is what drives humankind, not the hope, but the determination to create beauty, to imagine beauty, and uh, to agree uh, that life can be beautiful. Uh, so I don't know about hope, but I am pretty sure that there is still determination in Turkey. However, um, I should give a lot of credit to my country and to the people who protested during Gezi uh, you know, uprising or protests, uh, because they did what they could. Uh, there was massive police violence, but today if you ask them about Gezi uprising, they would tell you, oh my God, thou, those were the most hilarious days of my life. I didn't laugh that much before or after, uh, because, it, because it was uh, the carnivalesque atmosphere. It was the textbook Anton Negri uh, you know, type of carnivalesque protest. Uh, and that kind of um, experience is accumulating in several places, like in Tahrir, in Tunis, in you know Madrid. It accumulated in Athens, in Istanbul. I, I have seen several of them, and I've reported se from several of them, and I saw the same thing. And that's another topic. But um, I do think that they tried a lot, and you know, the streets were the last option. Therefore, Gezi happened because they were removed. These people were removed from the representative, uh, you know, system, uh, the pre representative democracy, because of the uh, amazing, you know, uh, you know, talk by Sonar. Like he, he made it very clear why, and they were removed from the. Uh, their voices were removed from the justice system as well. So the only remaining space was streets. So they. They were there, they, they and the entire thing was like, you know, we are here, we live in this country, we, we are also, you know, people and citizens. But then uh, the police violence stopped them uh, making another, you know, the other step, the, 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 the following step would be really bloody. It was already bloody, but it would be far worse. So I think people are waiting now, just waiting, which is, which is a, Mm, which is not a mm, very carnivalesque situation. It is quite insane and melancholic, actually. I have uh, Henri Barki next, and then I see Yvette also. Uh, Henri Barki. Coup lover. I wonder if you can explain a little bit the psychosis in the Turkish press now. I mean, 90% of the Turkish press is controlled by or is poor government, let's say. And the kind of garbage, to put, to, put, to put it blind, mildly, that comes out every day, is it possible that they believe what they're writing? Or, so what is it that drives the individual journalist 
on a daily basis to to write things that patently aren't true and and is it, are they afraid are they paid i mean or is it do they really believe it wow how much time do we have <laughs> This is, how much time do we have and how is your stomach? Like, you know, uh, this is a really uh, complicated and uh, partly disgusting story. I think it also goes back to 1980. The construction of media was not really healthy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, it, didn't, it didn't start with Erdogan at all. He just used the weaknesses of the, you know, media uh, of Turkey. And it, also goes back to Abdullah Hamid as well. But you know, the last round started in 1980. Uh, the owners of the media companies can also own other businesses. And this is where the things happen. Uh, so in order to um, do good with the other businesses, media companies uh, always wanted to be close, uh, get together well with the political power. Uh, so I think Erdogan uh, is the you know politician who used it to his ben uh, to his benefits uh, in the best way possible um, this is one reason and you know individually well I don't know uh, I I really don't know but there is every a uh, little bit of everything I guess fear um, you know uh, power whatever you call it but then there is this uh, con uh, there is this um, concept that I cannot pronounce in German. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Hannah Arendt's concept. It means lining up uh, with the ruler. Uh, it's a very very long German word, uh, and it is in that book, the Turkey Insane Gleich and Melancholy. Schon. What struck me most during the you know first period of uh, Tayyip Erdogan was actually uh, the people, the number of people and the deg de degree of their enthusiasm to line up uh, you know, next to the ruler to the, this, you know, with this new movement. That was so um, terrifying because obviously this uh, right-wing movement was not coming from a democratic background. They didn't have the culture of democracy at all within the party or outside the party. And they wanted to believe even more than the party itself, that these guys, this new movement is democratic. And they were the ones who legitimized this political movement. And it wasn't only local, by the way. You know, A lot of media, international media, especially in the United States, did it. For me, it was so difficult to talk about these things, like uh, before Gezi, especially before Gezi. Uh, whenever I talked about the you know rising authoritarianism, things are going wrong in Turkey, be careful about it. Everybody was telling, like, what do you want? You're having some real democracy now. This is the democracy of real people. And I'm sure uh, they are now regretting those moments because they are having here some real people and real democracy. So it is, it, that happens same way, same way everywhere, like, you know, real people, real democracy. We are not a party, we are a movement, blah, blah. But the, uh, the, the, the you know, journalists uh, was, I think it, th that disappointed me most, and the intellectuals, how they were racing mm -hmm. to legitimize this uh, movement, and how they were, you know, in competition to sanctify um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan himself. That was, I don't know. It is, I think it is some sort of psyche that dates back to Ottoman Empire. Um, Turkey is a very young republic, and I do think that the culture of equals is not really uh, is not as um, as recognized as you know acknowledged as it is I don't know in Europe or in the United States. So they wanted to be you know servers of the ruler maybe, but there are a lot of journalists who are resisting, and there are you know very good friends colleagues at prison because. They, they resisted. So just to uh, tag on two things, one uh, on Henri's question, I don't know that I have the answer to that, but uh, whether or not the journalists and other people who you know, write these lies really believe in them or they do it because this is what they get paid for. I think to me what is more interesting is that 
the elites, uh, after a while, forget that they have created a media which is, whose job is to lie in the first place, mm -hmm. and they start believing everything they read. So the journalists might be making stuff up. Maybe they're not. Maybe they also drank the Kool-Aid. But if they write stuff as such that, you know, the judicial, the, go back to some of the U.S.-Turkish issues, for example, uh, Zarab court case, Gulen's extradition, the, media, the courts are independent in the U.S., there's no doubt. They're not in Turkey. And if the media starts writing that the courts are not independent in the U.S., that's what everybody thinks they are. And so that every judicial decision, therefore, seen as, is seen as a political decision. And I think whether or not the journalists believe in that, many AKP elites actually buy into that when they start reading it. So I think one of the risks of a, creating an unfree media is that after a while, uh, you, st you, uh, st uh, you actually you forget that the media's job was to tell to everybody and to you, and you think that they're telling you uh, facts now. So I think that's something that I've been seeing in Turkish uh, political context because all these crazy theories come up and you wonder how they believe in it. And then yeah. you realize that, well, if this is their reality, maybe they have nothing else to compare it against. And I think that's a development that we're seeing a lot. I have Yvette in the back. Yeah. Please identify yourself also. Yeah. Yes, uh, sorry. Yvette St. Andre, the State Department. Uh, you have chosen an interesting place to take up residence. Croatia, the <coughs> Balkans, the Western Balkans. Um, as you've been there, of course, the history of the Balkans during the same period during which you're writing and the build up to the wars that occurred there. What have you learned while being resident in Zagreb yeah. and your travels in the region that you can bring home to Turkey? Um, their experience of war or like pre-war experience is pretty much like Turkey, Turkey today, which is terrifying. Uh, because they all say the same thing, you know. One night we were neighbors, and the following morning, we following morning we were enemies. Which seems like a cliche, but actually this is true. This is what happened. Uh, so, and I, you know, sometimes when I see a similar uh, degree of tension in Turkey, uh, I, I am terrified because civil war is. Oh my God, that is the worst option. That's a, that's the worst ca worst case scenario. Um, but Balkans is, you know, they don't like this word, by the way, in Croatia. Yeah. <laughs> no Balkans at all. It's like, mm. <laughs> um, I, I, I like the country. I'm like, you know, th this is not a political answer. Not really. Uh, they have been through a recent war. Uh, so it gave them some wisdom, I guess. They are so relaxed. And I think they know what is important and what is not. Uh, after seeing death. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I love that country, and this is what I learned. Like, you, you know, after war, you just cool down, and things uh, become more clear to you. I hope my country does not have to, ex will not have to experience that, but yeah. That polarization is still there, but nobody's acting on it, and everybody is now uh, afraid of acting on it. So. This is quite a relief uh, for Western Balkans. <laughs> a question here in the middle. All right. Uh, my name is Emre Rol. I'm from Sabancı University in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, so now, Chaptai, when you were um, summarizing the effects, your geeky summary about the effects of the 1980, you said something very accurate, in my opinion. You said it created a rupture between the working classes and the leftist parties. There's another rupture, though, which is kind of overlooked, the rupture between secular Kurdish movements and the secular Turkish movements. And in my opinion, that rupture had a chance to be healed, and perhaps even partially healed, after the Gezi movement in 2013, in the form of an old Kurdish party turning into an umbrella leftist party, HDP. Mm -hmm. And actually, it defeated the infamous uh, national threshold that you were talking about by getting more than 10% of the votes. Now comes the question. Mm -hmm. Today, we are in a different Turkey. Um, we are also in a different Middle East. A um, lot has happened since 2013 in Syria. Do our speakers think, would there again be a moment in the future where two major secular movements in Turkey, both predominantly nationalists, Turkish secular nationalist movement and Kurdish nationalist movement slash leftist movement, would they find a platform to work uh, again 
in the form of a new party or anything else, which then might uh, empower uh, opposition as opposed to AKP. Thank you. Uh, well, one thing I would say uh, is uh, that there's a backstory here uh, that goes back to the founding of the, the Turkish Republic, uh, and that is why the Kurds get treated so badly, um, and they get treated badly over and over again, and not just by the Turks, by the United States as well. Uh, and uh, I'm sure most of you already know this, but uh, when modern Turkey uh, came out of the uh, uh, the ruins of the Ottoman Empire, there was a national pact at uh, the beginning of the fight back against the Allies, and Turkey came as a result of that. Um, and Mosul and Kirkuk were the two places that, didn't, that did sign on and didn't get into Turkey, which is why there's the Turkish feeling uh, uh, about that area. But it's also why there's so much strong resistance to uh, uh, Kurdi Kurdish nationalism, as they see it, because in the 19th century, uh, with the help of our good friend Russia, uh, the Balkan provinces of the empire one by one were peeled off on the basis of ethnic nationalism. And uh, Ataturk and the Turks in the 20s drew the line. They said, okay, this is it. They famously, we don't want any more. We're not taking any less. And uh, so for the 20th century, the, the very idea of discussing anything like this uh, just uh, caused apoplexia. And that, that I think, is, is a lot that's behind uh, the whole question of the Kurds and what happened there. And, and it's rooted in, and this, to get back to your question, rooted in the philosophy of the uh, Republican People's Party, uh, which has always been very anti-Kurdish for that reason. So whereas we can sit here and say, okay, these people have, have very much things in common, why aren't they uniting? Uh, that resentment on the on the Kurdish side, bad treatment by everybody, uh, one after another on the Republican people's side. These people are just going to take as much as they can get and walk out the door. So I think I think that's a troublesome aspect of what seems to be a, a logical uh, 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 connection. And one could also say that uh, Moral Akshener and her new party, since she is. Uh, a, a religious woman could also provide an answer, but they even more have a, a strong antipathy to, to any uh, Kurdish thing. So I don't know how we solve the problem. Um, but it's a, a problem that should be solvable, but it's not. On the other hand, Erdogan can famously reverse himself in a nanosecond. So he might decide, uh, even as we're speaking, that no, he loves the Kurds again, and it's all on. Mm. This, is, this is a topic close to my heart because um, I started uh, journalism when I was 19. I'm from Izmir. I don't know if you know Izmir. It is the most, uh, you know, Western, liberated, uh, Greek, you know, a lot of Greek influence. And, you know, uh, the conservative Turkey describes us as half infidel. Uh, so I'm c from that part of Turkey, we don't have no Kurds until we go to university in some other city. Uh, so I started law school, incredibly boring. That's why I finished it very quickly. Uh, but on my second year, uh, I started journalism full time over time. I killed myself over journalism. And the first thing I did was go, going to Diyarbakir. And it was the first time I learned that there, w there is something going on in this country because I didn't know, because there was nothing on the papers. The only thing you saw was, and this was happening always during dinner time, uh, on the you know primetime news on the state TV, they were showing dead Kurdish people saying that they were hunted in their caves, and this was the discourse. So you were eating as a kid and watching the dead Kur Kurdish people. Anyway, so uh, the you know guerrillas, uh, the militias, and uh, those you know PKKs, PKK uh, members. So. When I was 20, I saw the first Turkish people face to face. And then on, until I lost my job, and in fact I lost my job due to an uh, um, article that I wrote about uh, um, a massacre on uh, Turkey, Iraq, Turkish Iraqi border, uh, Robovsky massacre, which killed more than a dozen kids. Um, so yeah, until that time, until tw 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 uh, 2012, uh, I wrote about Kurds, you know, a lot. Uh, and I, you know, I kind of know about that topic. I knew about that topic, in fact. But lately, uh, 
due to the you know incidents, due to the events in the region, Kurdish issue uh, transformed from a question of uh, a issue of Turkey to a Middle Eastern issue, which I lost track. Th this is why I lost track. I cannot know anymore what's going on in there. Uh, the information is not healthy, and the politics itself is shaping in another way. We were talking about human rights uh, in 1990s. Uh, we were talking about equality and political representation. Now we're talking about tribes. Uh, you know, the, the politics, Kurdish politics, uh, are, are, is taking shape according to other references. It's not modern politics references anymore, but it is more complicated, com complex Middle Eastern, uh, you know, politics. And it, I am very sad that it is appearing to be one of those Middle Eastern issues that is, uh, you know, that won't be solved until eternity. Uh, so it is uh, a very sad issue and a sad question, and I really don't have an answer. But uh, for the first time in my life, uh, I did, you know, support a political party, and that was uh, HDP uh, in that, you know, election. Uh, it's not because I agree with them uh, on every topic, but I thought that was the only way that Turkish democracy could be more representative and uh, the parliament would be like uh, just and equal in terms of representation. But it did not happen, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, quick word on uh, Izmir, uh, and then I'm going to try to tackle your question also, uh, since you mentioned it, Ece. I'm always fascinated by Izmir because Turkey, Turks consider their country has three large cities, Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir. Izmir is unique compared to Ankara and Istanbul in the sense that its political identity has not been transformed by the Anatolian immigrants, but it has actually, for the most part, transformed the immigrants that have come to it. Mm. So uh, Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir have seen their populations triple in the last 40 years, since 1980. Istanbul is a city of 15, Ankara 4.5, Izmir 3.5 million people. Proportionally speaking, they have grown in similar um, uh, percentages. But Anatolians have, to a large extent, sh reshaped Ankara and Istanbul, but Izmir has somehow, you know, taken them in and, and reshaped them. And I think I find it fascinating as a city, as an urban environment that has kind of kept its identity and made people that come to it look like it, unlike the case of Istanbul and Ankara, where the people who come to Ankara and Istanbul make Ankara and Istanbul look like them. Um, so th th clear divergence, which also explains the very strong opposition based in Izmir. Um, we talked about how Turkey's divided. Uh, Robert talked about how this division can be really uh, big gaps in certain places. Erdogan's AKP wins Ankara and Istanbul by, uh, you know, 42, 44 percent, never a majority, a plurality. Uh, CHP opposition wins Izmir by 70 percent. So it's, it's not just a majority, it's also an, a landslide, and I think just a fascinating city um, for sociologists and other uh, nerds and geeks to look at. Um, the question on HDP uh, and Turkish uh, left and Kurdish left, uh, whether this alliance can reform, I think you can't underestimate the role of uh, charismatic politicians in Turkey. Uh, uh, so so uh, somebody like cool Angela Merkel could never win in Turkey, even if she delivered 5% economic growth. <laughs> uh, you know, in Turkey, it used to be that Ecevit or Demirel, or and like in Greece, it's not a Turkish phenomenon, I think it's Southern European Mediterranean phenomena. In Greece, it was always a Papandre or Karamanlis. In Turkey, it was or Demirel. They never left. Now it's always Erdogan or Erdogan. Um, I'm not joking. It's Erdogan or Erdogan because he's the only charismatic political leader. Mm -hmm. The exception being Demirtas, the leader of HDP, who built this alliance with the liberals and allowed the Kurdish Nationalist Party to cross the infamous threshold for the first time. He made the HDP as an alliance of liberals and Kurds, uh, the third bloc in the parliament. Uh, you... Even if you didn't like Kurdish nationalists, you had to recognize their demands because they became a kingmaker. Very charismatic. He went on TV, played the Saz. It's like the Turkish Buzuki or Balalaika. It was his uh, Bill, uh, Bill Clinton moment playing the sax, which is why he's in jail. Uh, because then he ran an election campaign saying the hash his hashtag was, we won't make you president. That was telling Erdogan that he couldn't become president so long as he was around. And he's in jail. And I think uh, that... In the absence of a charismatic leader, such as Demirtas, it's going to be really hard for Turkish left and Kurdish left to coalesce again. Uh, the synergy is there. I think when you add it up, the math kind of checks out. You could get up to near nearly 40% if you unite these two forces. 
Uh, and this has happened in the past uh, where the left was not divided in the 1970s. Remember I mentioned Ecevit's rise to power. Uh, the only time the left in Turkey came to government was under Ecevit. It was unusual, um, powerful working class movements that were in the leftist party. Ecevit was completely charismatic. Um, of course, Zeitgeist was in favor of the left. This is 1970s, and he reached 44%, which is the maximum uh, that the left has ever done. Um, so I think it's it's feasible, but uh, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath before I saw a charismatic leader rise up again. And I think Demirtas could have played that role. Um, he may have missed it uh, when fi fighting with the PKK started again. Of course, a lot of people expected him to distance himself from the PKK. Uh, I think that was really hard for him. Uh, there was a chance that he would be assassinated by the PKK had he done so, or simply replaced by the movement. Uh, in the Kurdish movement in Turkey, unlike the Irish case where the political wing is dominant, that's uh, Sinn Féin, and the military wing reports to it, IRA. In Turkey, unfortunately, it's been the opposite, where the political wing is dominant to the military wing. So the HDP traditionally takes orders from the PKK, and uh, we've seen in the past how HDP leaders that crossed the PKK were taken from party lists, uh, uh, mayor of the Arbakar, Baydemir, uh, and others. So I think it, he was either afraid that he'd be politically trashed or maybe physically assaulted had he crossed paths with PKK. But that meant that Turkey missed a golden chance uh, to get both a unified leftist movement, but also this charismatic person who could have uh, definitely you know, uh, uh, catapulted these different forces into one organized uh, political movement. But he's still around, so I think there's still an interesting uh, story to follow. And I think that uh, charisma is something you were born with. I, you may probably improve it later in life. And, and in, next to Erdogan, I would say he's the only other Turkish politician around who has that. So I would say definitely watch him. Interesting uh, personality. Yes, uh, question? Cenk. Hello? Yeah. Yes, my name is Lawrence or Cenk. I'm a, also from, my mom's side is from Izmir. Um, <laughs> but we're also, uh, my mother's side is a, product of Kurdish immigration over there so but we've we call Izmir home for over 50 years now um, I'm studying at Koch University in law and um, my question is after this last year's referendum I think what's this, what's scary to me is just that there was this uh, the influx of those un, unsigned ballot or un, unsealed ballots and so I think Turks are maybe questioning like the legitimacy of elections now that will happen and so what is your take, I guess, with the coming up 2019 elections and how people were, how people react on both sides? I mean, now that there was this kind of iffiness from the, the referendum, um, uh, I guess, debacle. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one of the things that is uh, that creates the insanity is uh, the bombardment of incidents. Uh, there is not one moment to breathe and, you know, uh, digest the political um, incidents. Uh, so, you know, referendum is so passé. Nobody's talking about that anymore. Uh, or even the coup, it, nobody's talking about that anymore. So the political agenda is changing on daily basis. Uh, I think this country will experience that as well. One day you're talking about North Korea, the next day you're talking about, you know, uh, um, the, the, the arms and so on and so forth. And then the next day Trump does something, you know, really, uh, you know, interesting, and then you start talking about that. It, it has been like this for 20 years for Turkey. So referendum is like, you know, which referendum? <laughs> as in which coup? So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was, you know, done and sealed. It was leg illegitimate, and everybody—not everybody, but like you know, people who are in a position who are capable of critical thinking, in fact, know that it is. It wasn't legitimate, and for 2019 elections, as Robert put it perfectly well, there are changes in Erdogan's politics in nanoseconds. So he is now <laughs> playing for. Uh, you know, Kemalism that, you know, and every one of his spin doctors is now uh, advertising Ataturk and how they were, in fact, have been in love with Ataturk all this time and they have been, you know, you know, not saying it and so on. So it is like, you, you don't know how, you know, when to laugh, either to laugh or cry sometimes, but now they have Ataturk. 
Now, so uh, 2019 uh, elections probably will be uh, played o over Ataturk. Who owns Ataturk more? Sort of, and th th this has been like that. Uh, it's like you know, if there, you know, if somebody will, uh, you know, um, use Kemalism, it will be us. You don't know anything about Kemalism. Would be uh, most probably Erdogan's uh, next sentence to CHP, who is founded by, by Ataturk. So yeah, uh, this is a, this is uh, part of the confusion. Mm, that we have been subjected to. It, it was like a massive uh, experience since 20 years. It is as if, you know, ran by aliens uh, to see if we are going to go really mad or not. Uh, but then we know that it was, we learned that it wasn't by aliens, but it was this another experiment, experiment called uh, Moderate Islam. And Turkey was the, you know, guinea pig of that, and it was very, very tiring to be the guinea pig for that uh, experiment, experiment that already had failed. Yeah. Just quickly, uh, before we wrap up, um, um, indeed a moving discussion. The referendum, I think my biggest concern is that um, it shapes uh, the way uh, anti Erdogan half of Turkey, which is a, about half as per the referendum, 40 million people, it shapes the way they look at democracy and voting, meaning um, there were regular allegations of widespread irregularities, uh, ballot stuffing. Uh, we don't know if they were significant or significant enough to change the outcome of the vote. It was a tightly contested race. The margin was only 2%. That's a million votes in Turkey. Uh, Erdogan, the problem, of course, is not that there were these allegations, that Erdogan dismissed those allegations after he declared himself the winner. And there was an OSC report which said that uh, the campaign season had been made unfair uh, because state resources had been deployed in his favor. He dismissed those allegations also. So if you're in that 40 million that has voted against him, at what point do you lose your faith in democracy as a form of political participation? Because you think that Erdogan is always slated to be the winner. What's the point? So wh what point does it become like Egypt where turnout in elections is 35%? because it doesn't really matter if you vote or not. They're going to make sure that the elections are rigged at the end of the day. So I'm worried because I think Turkey's democratic traditions, though they are very deep, uh, Turkey has had a free and fair elections longer than has had uh, Spain. My friend Arturo is here, sorry. Um, <laughs> so it it's goes a long way, but after 60, 70 years, these elections were the first that were rigged, if that's indeed the case. Even if they were not rigged, 40 million people believe that they were. And that's why I think that the next elections have to be free and fair, if they're not, of course, that will change after that. Uh, I think it will significantly depress political participation uh, going forward. And that's, of course, an unwelcome scenario for Turkey. We want people's faith in democracy to remain, uh, remain resilient. So I would say uh, the, the campaign season of the 2019 elections and also the elections themselves will be really key determinants of how the, the anti Erdogan half of Turkey looks at democracy and their country's future. I think we're uh, almost out of time. This is an, uh, I found this discussion to be very moving, uh, incredibly insightful, uh, very poetic at times. And thank you, Ajay, for that. And thanks also, thank Robert, for, for joining. Me. Yeah, of course. So nice. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Absolutely. Thank you.